the independent chair of the inquiry into the Sheffield Street Tree dispute. Thanks for joining us. Could you tell us your name, please, and your role? Yep, my name is Alison Teal. I'm uh, working as a psychologist and therapist, uh, previously from uh, 2016 to uh, uh, 2022 May this year. Um, I was a Green Party councillor on Sheffield City Council, representing the Virgin Sheffield. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And thanks for coming and having this discussion with us um, today. So I'm going to run through a few introductory points. Please don't take anything um, about the fact that I'm mentioning you, these points to you because I'm running through them with um, everybody. Um, I do um, very much appreciate your coming to talk to us. The, the discussion is being recorded and broadcast and it will be available for people to watch afterwards. I just want to make sure you're aware of that and happy with that. Yes. Very good. And the, obviously the dispute was a time of significant stress and emotional upset for lots of people. Um, and um, there's a degree of emotive content to it. We here, though, have to be careful that we don't um, allow anything to be broadcast which might be defamatory or offensive or libelous. If I get concerned at any point that we may be getting close to that, territory I will tell you and ask you if you could adjust what you're saying and in extreme uh, situations I might have to uh, pause the hearing just so you're um, aware of all that. Um, what we want is to have a constructive and open discussion, it's a chance to hear from you your perspective, it's a very important perspective um, and um, it's part of the overall terms of reference I've set for my inquiry to help city recover from what happened and minimise the risk of problems re-emerging in the future. So if you're okay with all that, maybe I'll just start by asking if there's anything you'd like to say by way of introductory remarks before we get through a list of topics I sent you in advance uh, that I'd like to discuss with you. Anything introductory? Um, yeah, so just for context, um, I guess uh, participating in the tree campaign brought me into um, politics in terms of representation um, and that it was driven by the, the shock um, of uh, seeing uh, how policy can be so extraordinarily uh, detrimental to the real world and of course I knew all these things in theory but witnessing it on the streets um, and having that as you say, emotional, uh, visceral um, experience was uh, really quite profound. It's really changed me, and I know it's changed a lot of people. And so we've had this uh, sort of a rude awakening to the realities of capitalism, if you like, and how even a, a left-wing, supposedly left-wing Labour Council um, can be so caught up with that that decisions are made fundamentally always concerning money and all other concerns are uh, extraneous, uh, do, do, don't count. And so, um, and also uh, the experience of the, the way power works and the police and how the police were there. I, I naively thought, as did many of my fellow campaigners, thought that police were there to, to protect us and look after us but it turned out that they were there to protect the interests of a multinational company. And so this was, again, a rude awakening, something I might have read about, um, but became very real to me. And so that's sort of the context of how this sort of politicised uh, me more and a, a lot of residents, particularly then Reg and Sharon, that I um, got to know really well as a result of this, um, yes, the true fiasco. Okay, all right. Um, thank you very much indeed. So let me start by asking you um, how your concerns um, over the removal of street trees first arose. Yeah, so um, a friend uh, just let me know that, hey, did you know that the, that, uh, the council are going to be felling trees um, on the way Road, which is very close to where we live, that's just like a minute walk, a couple of minutes walk at the most. Um, so we went over there to speak to people in the street and there were um, uh, an arborist crew there um, from Amy um, and um, you know, we had a bit of a chat to them about like, you know, what's, what's the problem because they, they weren't even particularly large trees um, and um, you know, it's hard to understand like, you know, why you know, 
that they um, produced beautiful blossom in the spring and you know made the street so much more attractive than it was. I was actually quite envious of this street because I lived on Westbrook Bank, which doesn't have any trees at all, and that made me really sad. And so I enjoyed, you know, I'd take a route, you know, and walking around to to go where the trees are to enjoy that because it's just so much um, more lovely. And so, um, yeah, we talked to them, and then um, I think it was Councillor Fox was the uh, lead for the street scene and the environment or whatever it was called back then. Um, actually had a chat with him as well and he was kind of like really affable and um, seemed to be that he wasn't entirely clear really and said he'd look into it I think he said. Um, yeah and so, so that was the beginning so we actually did block the load, uh, human chain uh, <laughs> at one point in, in that situation and uh, those trees are all uh, still there. Okay and um, was that in 2015? Mm. That was June, late June 2015. Okay, very good. Um, and did you have any other engagement with the council in the white, in the light, in the light of that, if you like, other than? Yeah. So the then I, so then uh, a group started to form, and then we learned about groups elsewhere. Um, but so yeah, so Save Netheredge Trees came into existence, and um, so I spent a lot of time on the street and in town and places gathering signatures for a petition. Um, I can't remember exactly when that was presented, but we did have more than 5,000 uh, signatures so it triggered a debate. Um, it was pretty clear from that debate that the, uh, the majority party, Labour, weren't particularly swayed by any of the arguments put forward. Um, and so, yeah, I think we knew then that we were in for uh, quite a uh, fight, but none of us could have imagined <laughs> how far, how long it would last and how far it would go. But yeah, so I became very much involved then. Okay. And then in 2016 you stood for election. Why, why did you stand for election? What was the platform you stood on? Um, so um, I actually uh, was approached by the chair of the Green Party. Um, who uh, was aware that I, one of my political, I've got two main political passions, one is women's liberation and the other one is about the environment. And um, so she said, do you realise no women are standing? What are you going to do about it? So, <laughs> so, so okay, I, I guess I will put my name forward. Um, I didn't feel we might be ready for it. Um, but I guess, I, I, to be honest, I can't really remember entirely what my thinking was at the time that I was certainly... I'm sure it crossed my mind that, that maybe I'll be able to do something about the tree cam campaign, maybe I'll be able to do something uh, to help protect trees um, if I become part of the council. And, and certainly that would have been in my campaign literature and what have you, and, and door knocking and so forth. I would have been speaking to people about the tree campaign because I would have recognised lots of people because more and more people were getting involved. And um, so I just scraped in though, yeah, I, just, I just got in by eight votes, but I was elected in May 2016. Yeah, and what was, what was your impression of the views of people in your ward? Consternation and astonishment. <laughs> you know, it was uh, very difficult to make sense of. Um, you know, we had these gorgeous, gorgeous tree-lined streets, which I hope I'm sure you must have visited. <laughs> it's just a very, very lovely area, and that's why people are attracted to it. You know, it's mostly about the trees, you know. um, and it's just so pleasant to be there. So even if you can't afford to live in one of the lovely houses, and most of them are more expensive now than they could have been a while ago, um, you know, it's just a real pleasure. So as I say, like when I'm thinking about where I'm getting from A to B, I'll do my best to make sure that you know, my roots includes one that's lined with trees, and a lot and people are there feel the same as I do. Like it's just a, it's an appreciation. It's a chance to kind of yeah, uh, enjoy nature, even though you're in the city. Um, yeah, but that's how they felt. They they were really really shocked. Like why would anyone want to to ruin this this beautiful street? Yeah. Didn't okay. make any didn't make any sense. Yeah. Okay. I, I understand. Um. So. Do you have a, a, a sort of um, assessment or impression on the views of the interest groups concerned about what was happening in the years after 2016 mm -hmm. in particular? We'll come to the period after, from 2016 in a bit, but in the early years, what was your, is there anything else you'd like to say beyond, beyond what you said about the views of interest groups and the concerns of interest groups? 
Um, oh, just that I'm aware that it's been ongoing for quite a while. So I, I didn't actually land in Sheffield. I moved into Westbrook Bank in uh, February 2014. So things had already happened before but that I was blissfully unaware of. Um, but I know that um, uh, Gillian Creasy and Rob Murphy, um, they are both green councillors who um, were really superb in challenging um, the contract in the first instance and, um, and also questioning uh, what the proposal was and the, uh, and the whole premise of the PFI and the terrible expense that would accrue um, into the future. Um, so um, I'm, I'm aware that that went on. I'm aware that there was a public meeting involving Professor Ian Rotherham and um, that, that, that the Green Party certainly and uh, many other people, probably like Friends of the Earth and uh, those sorts of groups, Shepherd Greenpeace, um, would have been aware and concerned. Um, but nothing had been sort of, there was no mobilisation of a political opposition at that, before that time to mm -hmm. knowledge. Okay. Um, you may have alluded to this, but what's your understanding of why the council was acting as it was up to 2016, notwithstanding the value local people in your area attached to the trees? What was my understanding of why the, of council, why the council were acting in that way? Okay, um, well I guess they were locked into a contract that they had signed up to, which uh, you'll recall we didn't have access to. And even as an opposition councillor, I mean, the, the big shock when I had my initial induction as a councillor, I remember the, the, you know, the leader and governance director saying, uh, you all have the same access to information as any member of the general public. <laughs> Which is like, really quite shocking to me, I had no idea. Um, that information <laughs> would not be accessible to, to me, that I wouldn't have over and above access to things like the contract. Um, if I had reason to want to, to read any aspects of it. So we're, we're very much in the dark about what this contract said, and so speaking for myself, I, I supposed that they must, they must be really contractually bound, which had left them unprepared, uh, shockingly, uh, that people might actually be unhappy about what they'd signed up to. And um, you know, it's, I, I believe that there were meetings before I was involved um, where people did express concerns already about the tree felling that had started in 2012, um, and that a little sympathy or understanding had been shown for that point of view. So again, it seems to be that I think because it's called a highways contract, the focus was very much on the highway. And anything that interfered with the highway it was seen as expendable, was seen as secondary or just negligible. And so my understanding is that they they were just thinking highway, they weren't thinking about the context of the highway, which is the natural world, they weren't thinking about how the natural world is affected by the highway and vice versa. They just didn't seem to have that sort of systemic way of thinking that uh, you know people who are more uh, nature, environmental, green-minded would naturally consider. So again, it's pretty incomprehensible that that they didn't seem to have factored nature or those that, that element at all. Um, and, and hence, they then they ended up in this awful situation, which. And again, you know, to, uh, the political realities like the PFI contract. My understanding is that they're constructed by legal people who are very highly skilled, and then you come up against councillors that may not have a legal background at all, and they're somehow, you know, that there will be officers there to support. But still, my understanding is that they're very, they're in a uh, far uh, less. Uh, a much weaker position because they don't have that knowledge. So whether or not Amy's lawyers um, were well aware that they might or might have guessed that they were going to run into problems, because I think there was something in the contract that there was some anticipation that there could be protests about the trees, I vaguely recall something like that. So it's not like they weren't war warned, but maybe it didn't come up in the actual conversation. So they signed off 
on a contract which made it extremely difficult for them to make changes. I mean, subsequently we found out that they could, because they did, yeah. but at the time that was the sense that I think a number of us made that, that the council had locked themselves into something that they really didn't ought to have. Yes, okay. Um, so you were elected, and um, I'm interested in <coughs> how you then engage um, as a councillor with um, officers and with other members um, during the course of 2016. And also, if you could say a bit to us about how, um, in that period, you were also involved in supporting action on the streets, as it were. Uh, yes, so I probably spent a lot more time on the streets than I did in the council. Um, and, you know, part of that was because then it became part of my role, really. Um, so what I've been doing um, as, a, as an environmental activist, tree campaigner, um, I was now also um, doing on behalf and with residents as well. But so it didn't, but it didn't really change anything. I mean, I, I was just a, a member of, of the group and... Um, we became you know, more and more um, active, not just in their region shower, but other parts of the city as well. And so I did whatever I could between, uh, you know, around meetings to be on the street and be present. We you know, had like, the WhatsApp group that alerts and so forth, so I'd attend as much as I possibly could. Um, and then in terms of the actual council, as I said, I was actually very limited in terms of information that I could access. But So I would use uh, the facility I had as a councillor to submit written questions mm -hmm. um, to the council meeting um, every month. So then they were obliged to give a written answer. Yeah. And, and I had the opportunity to ask supplementary questions to those written answers. Um, where necessary, I can't say I ever got a very good answer, but you know, we just, I just felt that we just constantly fogged off. Um, the other thing that becoming a councillor did was that it gave me uh, a more interesting profile to the media, so I was able to have opportunities to say write articles, um, or do need to do that sort of thing. Uh, if they came to a protest on the street, the media, then they would work out that I was a councillor and oftentimes they'd want to speak to me, so that gave me an opportunity to have a voice. Um, so that, that was a benefit, I hope, to the campaign, um, that I would be there and in that role, um, then and not... Um, in addition to being a true campaign, I was also a councillor, which yeah. seems, seems to have been helpful. Yes, OK, thank you. There were some controversial events in Rustlings Road in November 2016, you know. What's your perspective or your view on that? Do you know, it's funny, um, yeah, like I just, I still can't, it, it's hard to think it actually happened, you know, even though it's happened, it happened a while ago, and like just when I reflect on incidents like that, it's just like, oh, astonishing. And, and the way that they managed to get the police involved uh, to enable that to happen, and, I'm sure you, you might have uh, seen or spoken to uh, people like Jenny and Fried, uh, the uh, two women who were arrested um, on that day, and uh, you know just the whole like the, the dissonance of it, uh, being you know, knocking on the door, making an assumption that you know something terrible might have happened to a family member, and you know going out into the car, being asked to move your car, and it's just so extreme, and so you have to wonder. Uh, it seemed to be, uh, I think it was an act of spite, and therefore quite a misuse of power, I, I believe. It seemed to be about like creating this sort of shock and awe situation that would intimidate residents to such a point where that they wouldn't try this on again. Of course, it had that backfired horribly because it just raised the profile of the campaign so much more and more and more people started to get involved. So the more they upped the ante, the more uh, people were resisting, and th they don't seem to have observed that because they continued on this path of bullying, uh, of this kind of uh, bullying behaviour. Um, that was absolutely astonishing. Um, I, I didn't, I had, a, I had a, an appointment, I wasn't able to get there as early as I wanted, but I think I got there around 10 o'clock and most of the filming had been done except for Ellen, um, uh, who still survives, which is fantastic. Um, yeah, I helped um, 
to protect that tree when um, there was some disagreement about the because it had been felled on the street side that it was now unbalanced and they were trying to persuade the homeowner that their insurance would be void if they didn't felt the whole tree down. No, that's uh, sort of tactics that they got involved in and, and anyway the tree's still standing and I think it's in good health. And okay. I'm sure the residents are really pleased too. But yeah, what I weren't utterly devastating and, yeah. and cruel behaviour to engage in against the residents of the city you're there to to represent and look after, you know, I just I'll never stop being shocked about that. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, you were arrested in February 2017 and I wanted to ask you what you can tell us about the charges you faced, any comments you want to make on why and when they were dropped and any other follow-up that happened um, after that that you want to mention to the inquiry. Um, yeah, I think that, like, I know that there's lots of people with encyclopedic knowledge about dates and situations and stuff, and so <laughs> I'm not going to compete with them, but I can talk about the emotional impacts and the effects they've had on people. So, um, yeah, so so we, yeah, I've told the story many times before, but uh, yeah, Paul Brooke, um, as you know, went and sat in front of the tree. And, um, and, and spontaneously, a, a group of us, it was kind of like one of those um, uh, experiences where it was very uh, an unconscious sort of thing. I just felt absolutely drawn to it. It's like, that's not right, he shouldn't be on his own. And, and miraculously, you know, six other people felt the same way at the same time, or five other people felt the same way. And, and then suddenly I became aware that other people were also there, and were all sitting there. And um, so it's sort of like a really strange, strange phenomena. Um, and, and then it's kind of like there, there was a real sense of camaraderie. There was no way that it was very hard for Martin because Martin was there too. And he and his wife and um, they had a conversation because they had the children to pick up and stuff later. It's like, oh, I'm not sure how long. If I get arrested, how long will I be detained for? Will I be able to still pick up the kids? Ooh, not sure. So he had to leave. And that was really painful for him. I was really disappointed that he couldn't uh, stay with us. And so, you know, sort of uh, this sort of action creates like a real bond, which is uh, you know, quite remarkable. And so I think there's a real sense of solidarity about protecting this tree. And um, and then of course they just, they gave us multiple. I think went on for a couple of hours that they were trying to persuade us not not to have to be arrested because you know there's quite a lot of work involved in arresting people, isn't there, for the police and what have you? But anyway, it was a strangely convivial atmosphere uh, going to Shepcott Lane, the, uh, where we, and we were putting the. But when when we actually got into the cells, that was extraordinary. I'd, I'd had this idea that we would all be together, but of course we were all separated, and. Um, and it was a very thick door. It was like being put in a bank vault. It's an extraordinary, like, it's like all we were doing was sitting under a tree, and now we find ourselves isolated in a, a cell, an extraordinary cell. So it was just like so overblown, so unnecessary. Anyway, there we were. So I was in there for um, 8 hours and 41 minutes, which again is like extraordinary. And uh, it was very cold and rather lonely and boring and, you know, but um, so that so that was a very interesting experience. Well, I, I was arrested for it was under the trade union uh, legislation for interfering with a workman's tools or something. And um, and yeah, I wasn't surprised that it was dropped because other cases had already been dropped. So I never expected to end up in court. Um, I think it, again, I think it was an act of intimidation. It was meant to put people off. And again, it had the opposite effect. I think it encouraged more people to, to do that, and therefore, then they, I think they realized they stopped arresting people pretty soon after. I think it was like, well, we're going to have to look at something else now. Unfortunately, something even worse came along. Um, but yeah, I wasn't surprised it was dropped. And of course, yeah, um, campaigners did then sue for wrongful arrest, and uh, that cost some York police money it could afford. So, yeah, just what a. So the campaign has sued for wrong, wrongful arrest. Is there anything you want to tell us about that and the follow-up to that? Uh, no, not particularly. Okay, fine. Um, 
I want to ask you now about meetings you attended in the council in April 2017 and when there were concerns expressed um, essentially about your behaviour and how you were acting by the council's monitoring officer and what you thought about that and how you responded to that. Um, so you're referring to me being uh, asked to leave the chamber. And <laughs> the subsequent interaction you had with the council's monitoring officer, Gillian Duckworth. Mm, mm, okay, so um, yes, I wanted to point out that a uh, cabinet member had been misleading and I was asked to retract it. I retracted deliberately misleading, but couldn't retract misleading because I knew full well that they'd been misleading all along. So, yeah. I mean, it was on the subject of flexi pay, and I think that it was the pr previous cabinet member, uh, Councillor Terry Fox, had said that flexi pay had been used 140 times or something already. And <laughs> we couldn't find any evidence that it had been used at all. So, right. You know, I was being generous, calling it misleading. Um, but so, so anyway, so then, yeah, that was all um, a bit of shenanigans of going in and out of the chamber and what have you. Really, really did appreciate the support um, of opposition councillors, like everyone walked out. And I thought that was really, uh, really impactful in terms of like sort of the sense of enough is enough, like you've got to stop behaving this way, you've got to start um, respecting us enough to actually give us the truth, to actually give proper answers. Um, it would have been nice if that had happened, but it was great that we had that yeah, solidarity in the statement that you know, we're not, we really shouldn't have to put up with this. So that was really good. Uh, I've got the next bit of the question. It, it's about the, the subsequent interaction oh, yes, you have yes, with them. Yes, um, right. okay. okay, so yes, so... Um, I was under, an invest, under investigation um, for, for that and also I was already under investigation I think um, because of some Facebook posts and things. They were having difficulty differentiating whether or not the time that I did my tree campaigning whether I was acting as a councillor or as a member of the public. Because if you're a Labour councillor you get to be a separate private citizen when you tweet things that are inappropriate. But if you're an opposition councillor, you don't get that luxury. You're always coming under the council rules. Like, so it's one, one rule for them and another rule for us. was very mm -hmm. clear. Yeah. Uh, this terrible hypocrisy in the way that they treat people. So again, this whole investigation thing um, it was a, a, a way of creating stress for me, a way to intimidate me. It's bullying. And so it's unfortunate to see, I have to be careful here, but yes, that I believe the officers were complicit with that bullying. Whether they were just following orders or not is now being the there for me. They were doing this and it was very unpleasant. Uh, Douglas Johnson was fantastic during that time. He was really, really helpful, really supportive, as was Rob and Ajit as well. It was really good to have their support. Um, but yes, it, uh, it was very wearing and um, I don't know that if this process is going to do anything to uh, address those sorts of effects, the bullying, the emotional trauma of a lot of this stuff, whether or not uh, you'll succeed in uh, being able to uh, highlight that in a way that would lead to some sort of uh, recognition I mean, the council repeatedly said that they've apologised, but it still doesn't feel like that they're really sorry. Mm -hmm. Doesn't feel like they really understand the, uh, the emotion. Yes, thing. yes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the you were then subject with other people to an injunction taken out in. Um, late in 2017 and I wanted to ask you about that. I also wanted to ask if you formed any view about why Amy were not part of the injunction. The injunction was taken out by the council, just the council. Um, yes, yeah, so um, yeah, it's strange isn't it because um, to take out an injunction against your own residence <coughs> 
uh, does, is not a good look, <laughs> politically. Um, and so, actually, I still don't understand um, why the council took out the injunction rather than me, because I get that it wouldn't have been a good look, look for them either, but other, like say, the anti-fracking uh, situations, why we had a quadrilla took out an injunction against the people of Western Europe. So I don't know why, yeah, I don't know why Amy didn't. I don't think we've got any answers to that yet, but someone might be able to enlighten me. Um, so I find that quite extraordinary. And also, I believe, I think we found out subsequently that the cost, the costs fell to Amy, not the council, but the council made, their, made a lot of, uh, uh, well, I think they made statements about how the cost of the campaign was being paid by the public first. So again, that was misleading or something was going on there. Um, so, um, again, so I've forgotten my phone. What was the first? No, you've answered my question. Oh, I um, <laughs> I, I, so the, uh, um, there was a court hearing basically on the injunction. Yes. Um, do, do you want to say anything about the hearing and the um, outcome of that hearing? The, the first, the injunction. The injunction, the yes. Injunction. We'll come on to what happened afterwards in a minute. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, I think that uh, there was some, it, just for me personally, it's some political persecution going on there. I mean, I can't be sure. There were a lot of very active people. I was just one of them, so it's a bit random, the selection that they made, the actual people they named in the injunction, but I feel that I was there for political reasons which again is a misuse, abuse of power, I believe. Um, it was um, yeah, very unfortunate uh, for us that um, yeah, Justice Males um, had a background uh, in corporate uh, law, and so it felt like we probably wouldn't be necessarily successful that he'd see things our way, and also did not <coughs> have to be careful, but I'm not convinced that we had uh, the best legal representation we might have had, but we're all very naive and um, hadn't been involved in anything like this before. So, yeah, unfortunately the injunction was granted. That was really devastating uh, because we thought that that would put an end to our protest, but yeah, necessity is the mother of invention and came up with a whole bunch of stuff <laughs> to enable mm. us to continue. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really satisfied that that was the case. Um, so yeah. Okay. So the injunction was taken out, and um, it imposed restrictions on what you were permitted to do, essentially. Mm -hmm. And I, I wanted to ask you um, how, if at all, what you subsequently did in respect of action on the streets changed. It, I mean, in particular whether you intended to comply with the terms of the injunction and whether you made your intentions to comply clear. I don't, I can't, I'm not sure if I said anything publicly about that. <coughs> but yes, of course I intended to comply with the terms of the injunction right. because the consequences were terrible. Right. Uh, and so, but what we did seek to do and did succeed in doing is finding ways to still be effective regardless right. of the injunction. And um, so the whole gecko in business, the whole business of, you know, that's why it became so important to get to, to identify where they were going to try and fail. Right. Uh, to get there beforehand um, so that we could put our bodies in the way before barriers went up. Right. Hence, you know, the number of times that uh, I and many other people have being squished by barriers and, uh, you know, that physical intimidation, um, you know, it was really extraordinary what was going on. That was the Argus in the first instance, then later it became security guys that were employed. Um, <coughs> that happened a lot, you know, so it was a real, real literal fight, um, you know, between, like, who's, who's going to get there first? Um, I've got memories of running like, from one street <laughs> to another to right. try and get this. Like they're setting up somewhere else, right. and then you'd be running um, to get to the other place to try and you know where, where you haven't managed to stop a barrier. Putting up, there's a chance you could stop a barrier somewhere else. Yeah. Okay. But I just want to make sure I've understood clearly what you said. So 
you intended to comply with the injunction. Absolutely. You didn't want to breach the injunction, but what you were trying to do was to find, I think I heard you say, creative ways of sustaining the campaign which didn't breach the injunction. Is that a fair summary? Creative ways of protecting trees. Of, cre of creating, yes, okay. Good, thank you. That's helpful, to just to have that clear. Um, what then happened was that um, committal action was brought against you um, and others for alleged breach of the in injunction. Um, so I wanted to ask you your sort of reaction to that, your experience of going to court for the committal proceedings and what you thought might happen mm. at the committal proceedings. Gosh, it was just, <coughs> again, it's one of those things, it's like, did that really happen? <laughs> because it's really quite extraordinary. But um, again, this horrible, you know, I, I, I miss, I miss, you know, my former ignorance about, you know, what people are capable of doing. So, you know, I had, um, so in my case, you know, uh, people uh, who work for Amy um, wrote uh, things about me, affidavits. It was very minor, actually, uh, but that it was there. It, it was, they, they had felt it was enough to implicate me that I allegedly uh, broke the injunction uh, about times I was there and stuff. But, you know, I knew, I knew the what the injunction said. So there are two two examples. So one, I was on some cobblestones outside of the Kenwood Hotel, and I understood that I was on their property and not on the highway. And uh, that 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 uh, allegation was dismissed right away, I think, or or, or the barrister had to stand up and say, actually, we haven't been able to prove that she was on the highway, so we forget that one. And then the other one was a massive uh, barrier that they created, but they'd used a private wall. And so all the time that I was in that barrier, um, I just kept checking that they hadn't put barriers in front of the wall, because if they had, then I wouldn't have been the injunction. Mm -hmm. But I knew that as so long as those barriers weren't there, I was safe, mm -hmm. because it says a complete, there has to be a complete barrier. Yeah. Um, so I, as far as I was concerned, I was not breaching the injunction. So, so there I was. I was accused uh, of breaching the injunction on two counts, um, and the, the evidence um, was so weak. And I knew that I hadn't actually breached the injunction, so I didn't really understand how come it was managing to go to court. Um, so I, again, I think it was politically motivated, which is outrageous. You know, absolutely outrageous, uh, and on such flimsy grounds that then they would actually, you know, like ask for committal, like right, to send me to prison. Like it's just, uh, and I'm grinning because I, <laughs> like I have this, it's just such incredulity about the whole situation. It's just like so. I never so as awful and as upsetting and shocking as it was, I could never take this quite seriously. Um, you know, I knew that there was that there must be some risk that I could be sent to prison, but it was just so hard to believe. Um, and then, of course, yeah, the judge actually dismissed uh, uh, the allegations against me right away, so I never even had to take the stand or anything, um, and which was was right and proper. And I'm grateful that, but just as Mel saw things that way, um, then the horror was that the council's spin, you know, communications team said that I'd been let up on a technicality, which is again this like, just extraordinary way to phrase it. The fact that the allegations were dismissed, you know, that's not a technicality. The fact that I was telling the truth is not a technicality. It means that I shouldn't have been in court in the first place. Uh, and so, you know, they spent all that money, they had to pay my barrister's costs. What a terrible waste of public money. Just for their spiteful actions. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Um, could you just tell me a little bit more about how the tactics of the campaigners and the protesters evolved in the light of the injunction? You sort of alluded to it in um, answering my question before last, I think, but could you just tell us a little bit more about that? Uh, yeah, so it became more important to uh, track where uh, Arbus uh, were going, they, they made it harder, they, uh, 
you see, I, this is where the dates might get a bit iffy, but they, they started to bring crews in from other places um, around the country, some as far as Hampton, which is extraordinary, um, uh, to do felling. And so where there were more and more people involved, thankfully. A lot of us were mobile, had access to a vehicle, so we could go from um, Olive Grove um, and follow them. And, uh, and then alert other people so that they could go and so the, the, the only thing that means we had to have, I suppose, really was to, uh, there's uh, where, where trees uh, were coming across the road or into, sorry, into private property uh, because the, the injunction is specifically about the highway, if we were able to stand on a private wall or in a private garden or if we could get to the wall before the barrier was put up and try not to be pushed and squashed away, uh, if we could stay in there. So we call that gecko because we mm-hmm. kind of like fixed on the wall. Um, some people did go up trees, so they were squirrels, uh-huh. and, um, and they would uh, be on branches that were overhanging, you know, pre- preventing them. That didn't happen very often, but it did happen. Most of us are great clients. <laughs> Most of us were middle-aged and retired people. You know. So we won't get the climbing trees so much. Um, so there was that um, tactic, and of course then the, the bunnies who uh, had to um, uh, disguise themselves so they could be identified, and they actually got in the barriers, and then health and safety um, uh, regulations kick in, and they weren't allowed to fell while there was someone present. And so uh, you know various uh, methods uh, that we had to prevent them. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, you so the committal proceedings against you were dismissed. C- can you tell us how you were involved thereafter in the action um, on the streets? Did you were you doing the same sorts of things, or how, how were you involved? Uh, the same. Yeah, I didn't change anything because um, although um, I mean they became much more careful about the values once they realised that they couldn't use power as part of that um, but um, so that opportunity was lessened um, but no we could, we could still try and get uh, using the techniques I've described mm-hmm. um, uh, if we could get there first then oftentimes we could uh, prevent a failure yeah. um, but with the security that's why they brought the security people I, I can't remember exactly when they uh, made an appearance but you know, they were there to stop us sneaking uh, between barriers and walls and that sort of thing. Um, and they did that like in a very physical way. Um, yeah, which you know, was really pretty confronting. Yeah. Okay. I didn't I didn't have brothers, I'm not used to being <laughs> pushed, right. around, pushed around like that. Right. Yeah, no, so I understand. It's, it's quite shocking. Yes, yes. Um As you know, in the spring of 2018, the council decided to take a different approach. Do you have any theory or hypothesis about why they decided to do that? Um, I think it's probably multi-factored. But things were, um, there's the Nearsbrook riot. which happened, which sadly I wasn't there um, for that, um, disappointingly, but um, I knew about it pretty quick. And um, and I don't know um, if you've been told about what what brought that about. Um, okay, so um, there was uh, one of the bunnies was a very important person to people outside uh, the barrier and um, she was being very uh, handled in a very uh, rough manner and uh, this was very distressing and so a family member yeah, was, uh, couldn't tolerate uh, what he was seeing and they pushed, pushed the barrier down and they all went in um, to protect her and, um, and I think that the whole event was just so shocking in terms of the violence and then the fear, I guess, there was a fear that campaigners might resort to violence, which they didn't. I uh, never witnessed that. Um, and so that, that fear that 
this is just getting out of hand. I think that um, I think that's what led to the calls um, that we can't really have this on the streets. Again, I don't think they I don't think that that meant that they understood the importance of the trees to people, uh, why people were so passionate. That it was more about perhaps the, just the embarrassment and the the fact that they've got security guards, they've got these high hairless fences, they've got the police involved, and yet still people were saying, nope, we're, we're not going to let this happen, we're not going to see uh, trees treated this way, and then naturally we're not going to see people treated this way. Um, so it was, yeah, uh, enough is enough, and I, and I think that that led to a pause, but subsequently, um, through FOIs, like that we have this like in the campaign has a layer of extraordinary people who have a lot of detail and <laughs> and pursuing information, getting to the truth through FOIs and um, this kind of thing. And um, yeah, it was revealed that following the course, there was an intention that the council that they were going to ring bark trees, which leads to the death of the tree, the tree can't survive it, and that was the plan after the pauses that they were going to do that um, to um, to enable them to fell hundreds more trees after the pause, um, which is rather shocking. But thankfully, uh, the tremendous work of one of their campaigners, Paul Barney, Paul Selby, um, was doing a lot of work um, uh, attracting the attention of the Forestry Commission because there were question marks about the legality of the felling in the first place. And, um, and so the Forestry Commission thankfully contacted the council before the ring barking exercise had, been, had taken place and that, that saved a lot of cheek because the, the Forestry Commission told the council, look, uh, you're facing the potential of a criminal investigation, um, you need to stop them. So that really then put, put, a, put a lid on it that they weren't going to pursue failing anymore until the legal issues became Okay. okay, thank you. Um, again, you, you've alluded to this a little bit, but I, I just want to ask you, with the benefit of hindsight, why you think the dispute arose and why it proved difficult to resolve it in 2016 and 2017 and the very beginning of 2018, when it proved possible by March, April, May 2018 to find a different way forward? I think because they had wasted so much money and so much time, they were massively behind the schedule, and they still are in some respects. Um, and so, it, it, again, as I, you know, my opening comments was this is all about money. And if, if money matters more to you than anything else, then that's what's going to motivate your decision making. And so I think that the campaign had made this whole process so expensive for any council that it was no longer tenable to continue to try and bully residents into acquiescence with this, this program. They just weren't having it. And so they didn't really have a choice for financial reasons, I imagine. You know, I don't know if I've mentioned that, I mean, my, the, my understanding, I think, don't know if it, it's not been proven, but it seems to me like it's a lot cheaper to, to maintain streets that have got saplings on rather than being mature trees. And of course mature trees do can disrupt the plant, etc. So they do require more maintenance on the ground as well as you know, maintenance in terms of checking the, the health and well-being of the tree and might need occasional branches removed and this sort of thing. So that's obviously a lot a lot of work. I've got 36,000 street trees to maintain that sort of work. And so you know half of that number I think, I'm assuming, because of the length of the contract, would have would cut costs and improved profit margins. Uh, because the campaign was so disruptive to, to that, I think that they must have got to the point where the contract wasn't going to be worth uh, what it ought to have been to the multinational company. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to ask you now about the, your views on the consequences of the dispute. Um, You've described harms the dispute created. Um, I want to give you a chance to say a bit more about the consequences of the dispute and also um, to tell us about any concerns you have over 
any issues that are not yet resolved or um, problems that could arise in future. I know I've asked several questions there, yeah. but we can go through them. But um, start off, and then maybe I'll well, well, come back to one or two points. So consequences. Yes. Well, of course, it's our city happened clearly as a result of um, what we learned about the lack of uh, transparency, uh, the difficult to access information, the difficulty to access um, uh, counsellors in terms of <coughs> uh, consultations, feeling that people like they love to have consultations, the Labour group, but very rarely do they actually <laughs> take very much notice of. Or, or, you know, the questionnaires are notoriously shaped in such a way, so public surveys are shaped in such a way that they're designed to get the outcome that they want, to get the answers that they want. Um, and so, you know, people of understanding become very jaundiced about the whole process of so-called consultations. Like it's just, yeah, it's very hard um, to take them seriously or believe that they're going to be helpful. So there's... Uh, there's that whole level of cynicism and lack of trust now um, that is definitely a consequence. Because people have seen inside and uh, they don't see that it's there to represent them. And that was shown very clearly that how the, the council was siding with the multinational corporation rather than siding with the people that they're meant to represent, which is like astonishing. So, so there's that, there's the lack of trust. Um, so now we've got the committee system, which, um, you know, I'm really hoping that people don't have short memories and that we are able to maintain a better political balance in the city so that no one group has absolute dominance, eight them or again, because, you, you know, in representative democracy, we do need to have a multiplicity of uh, voices coming from different political um, ideologies, etc. I think that's pretty healthy. Um, but, but most of all, what, what I hope the committee system will do, and I'm not convinced that it's found, like it's obviously still bedding in, but, you know, what, what I would really hope for, that one of the things that can be learned is that the community is an extraordinary resource. You know, like the Tree campaign really, really showed that. There are people who are so skilled and so able and competent, who are so ready and willing to give their time and these skills, their intelligence, their passion, to the council for free, because they really care about their city, they really care about nature and the environment, and they want, they want to help. Mm -hmm. And that's what like just blew me away. You know, like the commitment and the time so many people put in is just extraordinary. And if the council could just harness that, rather than being in opposition to them, if, it could, if they can actually bring those people in to the community system, not just through elected representatives, but directly, because there's just so much to give there. And you know, if, if that could if that could be something that came out of this whole process, that would be fantastic. You know, just to to uh, enable like active citizens to actually genuinely participate. I know they're not elected, so I know that they can't you know, they can't have a vote. But we should certainly enable them to sway uh, politicians to have that opportunity to to have that voice. Um, because yes, it's a remarkable resource that is utterly wasted in the city. Mm -hmm. um, and so hopefully the street tree partnership, that's probably given some confidence, I hope, to, to Labour councillors in particular, that hey, we can learn something from these people and they're very nice and they want to help us. <laughs> so rather than being afraid of them, you know, like welcome them in and, um, and that would be great, wouldn't it? Thank you very much, very helpful indeed, thank you. I, are there any other points in respect of um, concerns you might have over issues that are not yet resolved or problems that could emerge in the future? Mm, well, so uh, one of the big problems is that obviously a lot of people are really upset that you didn't have the facility to compel witnesses. <laughs> and so because that's where a lot of the truth will lie, isn't it? And we don't have, you don't have access. Um, to or an ability to uh, to have people who were very much involved, who have subsequently left. I, I think just about every senior officer that was involved in 
this whole ugly situation has now left the council, which is very telling, isn't it? I mean, it's, it can't be a coincidence that all of them have actually left. So one wonders about their motivations, one wonders about what they could tell us if if we had some mechanism to, to ask them to speak. So I think that reconciliation, uh, like this whole project in terms of rebuilding trust, etc., is really important. But what I worry about is there'll be a lot of truth that we just don't ever get to, that we just don't ever get to understand um, why um, various things happened, why people did the things that they did. You know, I'd love to, I'd like to understand particularly what, what the police uh, did and why they did it. Um, I found that really puzzling. So yeah, we'll still have a lot of questions, I dare say, as hard as you're trying, as whatever, you know, I'm sure you do an excellent job, but I think that there will be gaps, when they inevitably there will be gaps in the truth uh, that we haven't been able to, to access, but yeah, well, I, I don't think it will, uh, you know, I, I guess we'll just be left to make assumptions and make up our own version of what we think the likelihood was. It'd be just nice to have some things confirmed. Who do you think, with the benefit of hindsight, might have done things differently? What, what might people have done differently and when? Well, I guess from the, from the outset, they might have had the sensibilities to understand that, um, <laughs> that we live in harmony with nature if it's as best we can with Orti, and that, um, and that, you know, that, that the natural world is really important and that you know, trees are homes for birds and a multitude of other creatures and bats and you know we learned a tremendous amount about birds and bats and, <laughs> and all these things you know, it's really the campaign I mean, that was one of the strategies was putting up bat boxes and uh, encouraging bats to roost to protect a tree and all these sorts of things I mean the fact that um, no, it seems like no one they did consider, didn't they? Like they considered that there might be opposition, that some people wouldn't want trees felled, that it's in the contract somewhere, and yet didn't take it seriously. Um, so I just wish that there had been. Well, there were two green councils there expressing concerns. They weren't listened to. So it's kind of just this culture of like we know best, uh, and also a trusting. Um, I think like some of the officers maybe had um, far too much power in terms of the process. Um, like particularly high rate engineer type people who see trees as obstacles rather than vitally important parts of the ecology. Um, so voices like that were very much heard. Um, but alternative voices were kind of like, oh, <laughs> just considered to be of no consequence. Well, I, I hope that they've learned a lot now about, well actually these things really do matter and of course finally, finally, you know, the climate and biodiversity crisis has come to the fore and now Labour are actually recognising it's important. There were people in Labour a long time ago, I know that. But in terms of the majority of the party and their attitude towards nature, etc. Like that's changing very rapidly now, which is great. But back in uh, 20, uh, was it 2006 or something when this contract was first muted or whatever, I mean, there was very, very scant attention paid to that, unfortunately, even though we already knew since the 1980s just what we were facing. Um, so, yeah, just a shame that all along they didn't seem to get it, they didn't seem to understand how important uh, the environment is and that. This, you know, this appropriation and exploitation of the natural world is something that has to stop, but it's just taking so much time um, to get through to um, people who are principally motivated by um, money and assets and accumulation. Okay, so I've got through the list of questions I wanted to ask you. Thank you so much for you know, giving us such a detailed perspective on, on what your concerns were and the whole experience from your point of view. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us? Um, 
just, um, you know, just, just, just to reiterate my hope that, just in, in particular for this council, because that's what you know, the inquiry is ultimately about, about how it operates, that, that, the, the, it'd be nice if in your report <laughs> it, it ends up that with some recommendations about how to include the public in a genuine way, not just these consultations that everyone's going very cynical about, but in actually like face-to-face -face meetings. Now we can do that again, and actually, you know, they, they do have like they have the, they had the Amy Road show where people could go in and comment, but it seemed like again. Seemed like it was just tokenistic. It wasn't real. It'd be lovely if the lesson can be learned about how do we make engagement with the public real, and how can we show the public uh, that they're actually having an impact on what what decisions are made. That that would be uh, the best thing, as far as I can see, that would come out of this uh, inquiry. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Mm. Any anything else? Uh, no, that's, that's fine. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, Charles, okay. Stop the recording. Thank you.